Welcome to the Voices of the Jazda Summit and welcome to you, Wendy McKay, your researcher, director, class exceptionnel in human computer interaction at INRIA, as I, just, I hope I said it right, and the University of Paris uh, Saclay, annual chair for computer science at College de France. Uh, Eric Salobir, you are chairman of the executive committee of the Human Technology Foundation and the founder of Optic, an international research network and action network member of the French Digital Council. So you both participated in a panel this morning on how we can prepare for collaborative human machine intelligence. So Wendy, can you tell us a little bit more about the content of this panel? I think what's most interesting about the panel is that all four panelists were challenging the standard way of thinking about how we deal with AI and trying to think less about how do you create intelligent algorithms that do things for us and rather how you interact with algorithms and what is the impact on human beings and how do we rethink the ways in which we design interactive intelligent systems. Okay. Eric, what are the biggest challenges of the integration between all of this technology and us humans? I think perhaps the first one is to be sure that those technologies, and especially AI, so artificial intelligence, are designed to empower the human being instead of replacing it. Because, I mean, the, the, the most intuitive way is to say, OK, the machine can do so much fast, and uh, it's cost efficient, and so on, so we could replace the human beings and make the human beings obsolete. But actually, that's not the way it has to be. Because, I mean, it has to be human-centric. And so we need to be sure that we empower with those technologies, we empower the people. And for that, I guess that we need to pay attention that the machine doesn't uh, be a supervisor of the human being, like the machine is the boss and people work for the machine, as it's the case on platforms like Uber and so on. That we need to pay attention that the, the human, ag human agency is always uh, developing and, and we, we, we do a lot to uh, uh, give more power to the people. And perhaps the last point is just to be sure that those uh, systems are designed not only to increase efficiency, because they are very good at that, uh, so uh, everything is less expensive, faster, and so on. But we also need to increase resiliency, so the possibility for those systems to fail and without having damaging the human being uh, or uh, damaging the social fabric. Mm -hmm. Wendy, um, what are your thoughts on that? Because it's a fine balance. Yes, um, and I think, first of all, we agree uh, a great deal on this. And I think one of the challenges that we have is how to rethink interaction with interactive technology and think about that as an important thing because human beings have very different skills and capabilities and limitations than intelligent systems. And right now we're in a situation where we have a tendency to be very optimistic about the wonderful positive things that intelligent systems can do without really considering the limitations sufficiently. And so the question is how do you create partnerships between human beings and intelligent systems where together they do better than either one could do alone. And that means that we have to rethink the ways in which we create the interaction between the system and the user over time. Okay, we've seen how artificial intelligence and technology has uh, come into our lives, but will it improve it? Will it continue to improve it? Because it has in a lot of ways. Or will it be harmful to society? Maybe, Eric, you can start with that. I think that can be both. It just depends on the decisions we make and especially about uh, uh, public policies and investment decisions. Uh, so we, if we decide that we invest in something that will empower the people, probably it will be very good. And we also need to uh, focus on the ways uh, it can challenge the human beings and humanity in a very positive way. So for, uh, for example, recently we had the DALI 2. I don't know if you heard about that. This is an AI which from a prompt draws or uh, creates a picture uh, even faster and perhaps better than uh, most of graf graphic designers. And probably it will challenge graphic designers as photography has challenged painting. But uh, for example, uh, photography challenges portraitists, but it probably it led to uh, abstraction and other movements. So 
actually it pushed uh, uh, painters out of the comfort zone and they have to do better and, and probably it was uh, like a, an improvement. And we have to do the same uh, using those technologies so not to endanger people but to push them a little bit out of the comfort zone so they can develop like new skills and do better things in such a way probably it would be very beneficial. Mm. Do you agree? Yes, I mean, I think there are clearly situations in which AI can help, and there are many, many situations in which it makes lives of human beings much worse. And the challenge is how do we create a society in which we empower people rather than de-skill them or even replace them. And it is absolutely clear that there are situations, because of these differences in the skills and limitations of humans and computers that we can create things where together they're better but we can also create things in which it's much worse for human beings and so that's the real challenge that we have both as researchers and people who are building technology but also for policymakers um, and people in government who are trying to regulate this it's important that we don't just assume AI is going to be great for people but we actually measure it and think about how do we create productive interaction with technology that has both short-term and long-term positive effects on human beings. So we need to keep challenging this all yes. the time. Absolutely. Thank you both for coming here today to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.